Hi, Mom. Uh, so I got my ticket home from Europe. I get back on June 6th, but it's a really late flight because that was the cheapest, so it gets in at midnight. But don't worry, I'll get a shuttle from the airport so you don't have to pick me up. Like, really seriously, you don't have to. Okay, so love you. See you soon. Bye. Hi, I'm Steve Gaynor. I'm the co-founder of the Fulbright Company. Uh, we made Gone Home. Uh, I was the writer and uh, designer. Um, and thank you for taking a look at our commentary mode. Uh, whenever you find an icon like the one you just clicked on, um, you can find out a little bit more about the game. Uh, I want to thank everybody who's added commentary. Uh, Janman and Carla, my co-founders of the company, Kate Craig, our 3D artist, um, Chris Remo, our composer, Sarah Grayson, the voice of Sam Greenbrier, and Corin Tucker, um, the lead singer of Head to Betsy and Slater Kinney and other awesome bands. Um, so thank you, everybody, and enjoy commentary. So Christmas Duck. Christmas Duck um, is a fan favorite. He's kind of a mascot, I guess. And I think that's partly because it's a weird concept, a uh, Christmas duck, and partly because it's like the first unique thing that you encounter um, in the game. It's kind of personified as a little character. Um, but the thing is, uh, Christmas Duck was not planned. Uh, when we were starting the project, we were just we didn't have a 3D modeler because uh, Kate came on a couple months after we started, and we needed a bunch of 3D models. And so I was just going through the um, the Unity asset store. So I was going through the list and saw this Christmas duck, and I was like, "What is that?" <laughs> okay, and and I I grabbed it and we used it as like a test object just to set up the system where you can grab stuff and carry it around. And then I ended up saying, "All right." we got this Christmas duck, I'll hide the key under it. And instead of replacing the free model with a totally different thing, just made a real version of it. And uh, Carla modeled it and, and, and Kate textured it. And uh, we kept him in the game. And we're glad because he's everybody's little friend. Good old Christmas duck. Dear Katie, so much has changed, even just since you've been away. We moved into this house. I'm at a new school, and my big sister being gone for a year doesn't make it any easier. It doesn't feel real, but I'm not gonna let it phase me. I used to tell you everything, and if I can't do it in person, because you're off gallivanting around who knows where, I'll tell it to this journal, just like I was talking to you. Oh man, mom handwriting. 
we went through a lot of different moms for handwriting. <laughs> um, a lot of different moms contributed handwriting for him. Um, at first, uh, let's see, how did we do? What were we doing first? I think I just did it and it wasn't great. And then we had Emily do it. Um, but her handwriting was was used so heavily in other parts of the game that we had to find someone else. And um, I think we actually had Yanman try to do it for a while before he was dad's handwriting. Uh, and then we got Yanman's mom, and she was ideal for it. Really good mom handwriting. Yeah. <laughs> So I got my ticket home from Europe. I get back on June 6th, but it's a really late flight because that was the cheapest, so it gets in at midnight. But don't worry, I'll get a shuttle from the airport so you don't have to pick me up. Like, really seriously, you don't have to. Okay, so love you. See you soon. Bye. Hi, I'm Chris Remo, the composer on Gone Home. In my commentary tracks, I'm going to be talking a little bit about what went into creating the original music soundtrack for the game. Gone Home is an unusual game, musically speaking, in that it consists of two distinct music soundtracks. But one of those probably more frequently commented on is the collection of licensed Riot Girl songs that the player finds in Sam's cassette tapes strewn around the house. The other one is the original music that accompanies the player's undirected exploration of the house and underscores almost every one of Sam's audio diary recordings. When Steve first asked me to do music for Gone Home, I was really excited about it, but there were almost no parameters for what that meant in terms of format or scope. Having played an early build of the game, I started by just doing a few musical sketches with no real regard for length or usage, mainly consisting of vintage electric piano sounds like Wurlitzer's and Fender Rhodes. I chose those instruments because I wanted sounds that would feel at home in the era of the game. The Twin Peaks soundtrack used a lot of Rhodes, for example, but would also blend into the background and not share much tone in common with the abrasive Riot Girl guitars. Some of the instrumentation and ideas changed from those first sketches, but they also contained one of the main themes that ended up accompanying Sam's arc throughout the final game. Hi, this is Corin Tucker from Heavens to Betsy. And Heavens to Betsy was a band that formed in 1991, actually. Um, and I actually got the idea um, for joining a band when I moved to Olympia, Washington, and um, became a fan of the music scene there. Um, and it seemed like everyone was in a band. So I decided I was going to start a band too. Um, but I didn't actually start the band until I, um, I went home after the first year of college. I went back to Eugene, Oregon. and. My high school friend Tracy Sawyer and I started playing music together, and that was the beginning of Heavens to Betsy. Um, so I had told, you know, with my big mouth, I had told all my friends that I was going to start a band. And um, the summer of, I think it was 1991, um, my friend Michelle Noel booked the International Pop Underground in Olympia, Washington. And she um, helped organize a night at the convention called Girl Night, and it was all women musicians. So she called me and said, hey, let's get you on stage with that, you know, you want to play the, the show that I'm organizing? Um, so, you know, 
this totally new band that had never performed before. I mean, we'd never performed ever any kind of music. Um, got invited to play this big show at the Capitol Theater in Olympia in front of all of our musical heroes, right? Everyone from K Records, um, all of Fugazi was there, all of Bikini Kill was there, you know, this, this music that I was a huge fan of suddenly. Um, that, was our, that was our very first show, the very first Heavens to Betsy show. And um, we were terrified, but we did it and um, people loved it. And it was, you know, it changed my life forever that night. Oh my god, you are so lucky you finished high school before we moved into this house. So, it's the first day of school, and there I am, introducing myself to the class, and I say that I just moved into the house on Arbor Hill. All of a sudden, every kid in the room turns and just stares like I suddenly transformed into a mutant. I just stood there, wishing pretty hard for a rewind button. Because now maybe nobody knows my name, but they all know who I am. The Psycho House Girl. <sighs> Great. When you're, when when you're when you're putting like lamps and uh, and stuff around a house, one thing that you have to deal with is plugging them in. Um, and something that always annoys me about um, level design in games is when there's something, some you know, lamp or or piece of electronics that would have to be plugged in because it doesn't run on batteries, but it doesn't have a cable because video games and <laughs> so um, you know since since a big part of the point of Gone Home is the specificity of the house and the believability of all the details um, because of that Steve himself <laughs> I, I spent some late nights with my uh, meager Maya skills modeling custom cables for each of the things that's plugged in so that the cables actually run from the TV or the lamp or whatever to an outlet in the wall. It is a really good detail. I think that I'm, I'm proud of you for getting that in there, Steve. That's, that's important. <laughs> yeah. This is a severe weather warning. The Northwest Weather Service reports high winds and torrential rain conditions affecting the following counties. Austin County, Boone County, Dawn County, to Kelma County and Wistaria County. Residents are strongly urged to stay indoors and secure all windows and doors. Flood conditions are expected at lower elevations. You know that feeling where the first moment you see someone, it's like they have a big gold star around them and you have to get to know them. Well, there's this girl. I think she's a senior. She's usually dressed kind of punk, but sometimes I see her in this, like, army uniform. And she's always drawing in this notebook, looking so intense. I had no idea how I would ever, like, have an excuse to talk to her. Till I noticed she and her friends hang out and play Street Fighter at the 7-Eleven every day after school.
My name is Sarah Grayson, and I do the voice of Sam Greenbrier in Gone Home. I'm currently based out of Portland, Oregon, so uh, right around where the Fulbright Company is from, which uh, is part of, I guess, how this all came to be. Um, I started doing voiceover work probably about four or five years ago. It's been a bit of an on and off journey because I also have uh, had regular nine to five jobs that whole time. So I always get excited when I see uh, video game auditions come across because it's always been something that I wanted to do and uh, really excites me because I'm a video game fan myself. So there was an audition that came across that at the time was entitled Dear Diary and it had this wonderful description about being this, this sort of 16, 17 year old girl um, not too much detail about her, just that she was uh, you know, new to her school, new to, new to this place she was living, and her sister had moved away. So she was sort of writing out her thoughts as if she was talking to her sister. So uh, most of the time, I'll stand up at the mic when doing auditions. But for this one, I thought, well, no one's actually going to read their diary standing up. Like this is kind of a, you write your diary while lying down in your bed, or like sitting cross-legged on the floor, or whatever. So I end up having to pulled the mic down, sat on, sat on my couch, legs crossed, got nice and cozied up in like my pajamas, and, uh, and started reading it. Uh, so these are all the VHS tapes, or most of them, in the house, and these in the TV room are from only, uh, they only belong to Dad and Sam, uh, because Mom has some VHS tapes, but they're up in the bedroom. And you can tell Dad's because he writes in a big, heavy, uh, all caps uh, style handwriting, and Sam does not. So contrary to popular opinion, uh, the X-Files tapes are not Dad's, they're in fact Sam's. Uh, but stuff like JFK uh, yes. has an obvious dad interest, and some of the other stuff that we put in there was very much like, what is a dad movie? Yeah, you know what is what is a if when when we were growing up, for instance, like what is a movie that our dad or a neighbor's dad would have? So stuff like the Andromeda Strain or Moonraker, it's just sort of like, yeah, dads, dads love that shit. Yeah, dads that were born in the fifties uh, were were super into that kind of stuff. Um, and then some of it was, you know, stuff that we liked or remembered from when we were growing up. Like, uh, <laughs> you will know that Carlo was involved in making this game because Beetlejuice and Robocop are on, are on a VHS tape. Um, that's that a, most of what you need to know about Carlo. That's, that's true. <laughs> right there. So here's one of Dad's pulpy uh, JFK books. Um, he's now moved on from primary sources to theories about how JFK was killed. Uh, however, this one purports to contain the truth. Uh, 
yeah, the uh, publishing company is a doofy uh, inside joke because, you know, there's Harcourt Brace, the publisher that exists, and so I was trying to think of a good name for a publisher, and being a big nerd, I immediately thought of Har Harcourt Fenton Mud and uh, how he basically sounds like a publishing company, so... You have to say who that is. No! <laughs> Alright, fine. He's uh, he's an awful character from... Uh, from Star Trek. Original Star Trek, <laughs> ca uh, which is called Mud's Women, and also there's another one whose name I, an episode of, I can't remember for some reason. Uh, I'm Mud. Ah, uh, fuck! Yes, okay. Um, <laughs> thank you. It's a Star Trek reference. You did yes. it, Carla. What? <laughs> Doors were actually one of the hardest things in the game to get working correctly, and uh, I know that there's still some bugs existing with the doors, actually. Um, but it's a surprisingly hard problem, which is why most video games uh, just have doors that kind of slide away into nothingness or open in strange ways or don't, you know, let you interact fully with doors. But of course, it's in a house like in Gone Home, a realistic house. It's uh, important that everything be as natural as possible. Uh, the one concession we made to video gaminess is that the doors all swing both ways, which never happens in a real house, but it's necessary to prevent the player trapping themselves in some strange state. Here we have Fresh Magazine, which is a synthesis and pastiche of uh, Sassy Magazine, which if you haven't looked at it or if it wasn't, you know, something that you cared about in the early 90s, it was very feminist and, uh, you know, strongly individualist and uh, actually gave good advice. Um, it was actually really good. Uh, anyway, so yeah, this is the type treatment, the super grungy uh, type treatment is totally indicative uh, that's, that's how it used to be. Um, oh yeah, and amusingly, uh, of course, our cover model is Rachel, Steve's wife. She had to, I had to, um, make her put on this awful light pink lipstick and, uh, do the 90s stuff imaginable. <laughs> and she did it. <laughs> it was your idea to put a braid in the front of her bang? Yes! Yeah, it seems like... <laughs> Congratulations. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Inside of this uh, file folder, um, you find the first uh, combination code in the game. Um, this code goes to Dad's lock filing cabinet, and it's 0451, um, which is a bit of a tradition slash in joke uh, amongst. I mean, it's not really an in joke. It's just a. It's just an internal reference yeah. um, amongst this lineage of of games that hark back to um, immersive sims that are kind of first-person exploration games that started with um, Ultima Underworld and System Shock and 451 was the uh, the first key code in System Shock and then it was also the first key code in System Shock 2 and Deus Ex and Bioshock and most recently Dishonored um, and yeah I've Personally, worked on a couple of games that had uh, 0451 as the first code in them, and we were really adherent to the the tenets of the interactive model and kind of the principles of design behind those games when we were 
designing how Gone Home works, and so uh, to maintain that tradition, uh, we also made it the first code in our game. And you made it the tattoo on your arm. <laughs> I also got a tattoo of 0451 because it, it is sort of a, a symbol of this certain philosophy of game design that's important to me. And yeah, this uh, writing, um, Breaking Canon, is <laughs> in Emily's handwriting. Uh, Emily's handwriting is technically only in the font that exists outside the game. She doesn't actually do the handwriting in any of the characters, but... Um, yeah, I had her write 0451 in her very distinctive handwriting, and then I got a tattoo of it and figured I would use that source image uh, as the image that you find on the inside of this folder here. favorite movies is The Apartment, uh, which was directed by Billy Wilder, and it starred uh, Shirley MacLaine and Jack Lemmon, uh, and it's from like 1960, um, and it's basically what Mad Men is, except actually from that time. Yeah. Um, it's super good, and uh, there's this weird, like, kind of humorous vocal tick that some of the, the executives in the movie have where they will, they will refer to something like, they'll say like, we're doing quite well dividends wise, or something, um, and Shirley MacLaine's character is named, her last name is Kublik, and one of the executives at, at different times says something like, so how are you getting along Kublik wise? Uh, so anyway, super deeply buried uh, Easter egg reference in joke, we made the 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 law firm Kubelik and Wise um, that prepared Oscar's uh, will, just as a little <laughs> wink and nod, a little hardcore Fenton. Uh, <laughs> Quite uh, Steve. <laughs> but yeah, um, the apartment. You should watch it. It's damn worth. It's totally worth your time. It's a really good movie. On laser disc. Yeah. Most of the bookshelves in the house are filled with undifferentiated books. I mean, they're not undifferentiated, but they're low detail because, God, it would be an entire dev cycle's worth of work to actually do plausible spines on every single book. That would kill us. Uh, and then to, re to repeat a whole bunch of books would also be sort of terrible um, and not be very plausible. So we had chiefly unlabeled books or books in which the labels have been rubbed off due to age, etc. And we had a few um, individual books that were more precisely and specifically uh, named. The way that we did the books in the game is we made like three or four of these clumps of books um, that have, yeah, the generic spines on them. They're just sort of filler books. They're kind of like what would uh, be in the bookshelves of like a lawyer's office in a in, in a cheap lawyer's uh, TV commercial. Or right, something. where they buy them by the foot and whatever. Yeah, yeah. and um, and then we we took one or two clumps and retextured them um, to all have specific readable spines on them. And then I just 
took those clumps and broke them up and scattered the individual books around in different bookshelves in the house so that hopefully I think every bookshelf um, has at least one unique book in it. That might not be true of everything in the library since there's so many bookshelves there, but um, I guess I should say every or almost every bookcase had at least one unique book in it that never repeated to kind of split the difference of, okay, they're not all generic, but also we can't afford to make them all unique and we didn't want to have any repeat in an obvious way. Um, so that was that was our, our strategy for trying to not do any of the things that we wanted to not do. <laughs> This is our old-timey record that we got uh, from archive.org, source of all good things. Um, it's um, by Adrian Rolini uh, when he was with, apparently, the Taproom Gang. Uh, the song is entitled Got a Need for You, uh, in case you can't read it, but you should be able to read it. And the duck I found on the internet. Um, <laughs> the uh, Adrian Rolini was, I got into him when I was on Bioshock 2 and helping uh, source the soundtrack for that and I did a lot of listening to um, 40s uh, big band stuff and Adrian Rolini was one of the ones that I really liked and so it was cool to uh, be able to revisit that. Sam's story uh, slash school assignment called uh, The Menstrual Cycle, a novella is kind of a fan favorite we've found like a lot of people have enjoyed it a lot and it's one of those weird things where it wasn't planned like it was i just let's see i, I had decided that i wanted sam to have uh to have done like some homework and i thought sex ed homework would be interesting um because it's sex ed is a weird class in high school to be in and and so I just I, I Google searched for an actual sex ed assignment um, and the the, the, the the assignment is a real sex ed assignment that uh, is given out in like the the Pacific Northwest like Seattle I think I think this is technically from the Seattle School District website that I that I got this from so I you know so so I found this thing which I didn't come up with that I was kind of presented with and I think I think I had been reading some stuff about like cool female spies in World War II or like saboteurs you know that had been part of like the French resistance and stuff like that and so that's why the, the history book is next to the sex ed assignment the the intended implication being Sam was doing history homework and sex ed homework and the history unit was on World War II and so kind of as a fuck you to all of the annoying assumptions implied by the sex ed assignment. She wrote this story about a woman in the war who was more interesting than her menstrual cycle, you know, like that is a person, uh, but while fulfilling the, the requirements of the thing. And yeah, it just, it ended up being this really kind of strange uh, juxtaposition of concepts um, that ended up saying a lot about Sam, I think.
So you know what they say about the best laid plans of mice and men? Yeah, it turns out it applies to Street Fighter too. At least I worked up the courage to walk into the 7-Eleven and ask for a turn, but all that practice at home did not exactly translate in the wild. So after I was finished getting my butt kicked, I followed them outside while they smoked. And that was when she asked me if I was that psycho house girl. But then she said she's always really wanted to see the psycho house. Her name is Lonnie. She's coming over tomorrow. I feel like one of the best bits of advice <laughs> was actually from the, the Fulbright team before going in to do the first recording. And it was a suggestion that I should watch some episodes of My So-Called Life, which um, was great because I'd watched them all when I, you know, when they were actually on. It was one of my, one of those favorite shows my sister and I would sit down and watch every week. And so going back and watching them was definitely not a hard chore to have to do. So I basically <laughs> went through all of the episodes I could find online in a couple of days. So it was a bit of a sudden binge watch of, of My So-Called Life, but it was, it was great because I think watching My So-Called Life was a nice reminder of what a more natural presentation of a teenager is. So it was really, I, I don't know that it would have gone as well had I not done that. Hello, my name is Kate Craig, and I was creating a lot of the environment assets for the game. Uh, not all of them, some of them I had help with, um, which I'll touch on a little later, but uh, most of the stuff like the walls and the floors, uh, some of the larger pieces of furniture uh, were my doing, and um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the environmental storytelling aspects uh, in Gone Home. I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't mention the work that my wife Emily Carroll did on the project. She did the, um, the house title image that we've used. Uh, for our wallpapers and for the start screen of the game. Um, she did uh, the loading cassette tape and she did the maps in the house. And actually Carla made a font out of her handwriting because we wanted something that was just a little bit spooky, maybe a little ominous, but um, something that sort of suited the tone of the game. Um, and uh, I was really glad to be working with her and I was really glad that the, um, the other guys were, were too. We had a really good time. Um, and uh, people have responded, responded quite positively to uh, her, her title screen, which is something that uh, I really appreciate, and I know she does too. Yeah, the, the biggest purpose <laughs> of the card was, yeah, to, to say, oh, Sam is 17, you know, if you look for this thing, but there's so much we need so much handwriting in the game, especially for like one-off characters that you don't see their handwriting more than once. And we knew we needed a birthday card from some member of Sam's more extended family that you were never going to hear from again. And so I was like, okay, it could be her uncle. And as an Easter egg, kind of like wink and nod thing, like we're fans of you know, the Looking Glass legacy of games and Deus Ex and Dishonored, and so I got in uh, contact with Harvey Smith, who was the lead designer of Deus Ex and the co-creative lead of Dishonored, and asked if he would just write on a piece of paper, Happy Birthday, Sam, from Uncle Harvey, and he just took a picture with his cell phone. And yeah, like, like five minutes after you asked him, it was amazing. <laughs> he was just like, yes, I will do this immediately. Yeah. <laughs> it was I, the best. I, I think, yeah, he, uh, he took a picture with his cell phone, and, and it was really cool. Harvey's a great guy, and uh, I love his games, and we're, you know, super honored to have uh, his signature in, the, in the, the hub of the Greenbrier house. Hell yeah.
the Goodfellow High School jacket and the logo generally is a reference to the logo for Minerva's Den, the um, you know the, the the section of Rapture that uh, that that DLC takes place in that we worked on together. Um, but uh, we didn't want to make it look exactly like the the owl logo from that game we wanted it to be you know an homage or a reference or whatever yeah so we decided that since this is a pacific northwest uh school and town and setting that we would go for some uh native um style uh representation and um let's see well actually the we were we were struggling with it for a little yeah. while because we wanted at first i was saying just make it look like a very, you know, 90s looking school mascot logo illustration that's just cheap that maybe one of the students did or something and the direction wasn't good enough and we didn't really have a, a good enough um, example to work from and then Kate actually came to visit. Oh yeah, that's right. And she suggested, oh what if it's like a Pacific Northwest Native American style uh, uh, approach and that really just clicked and made total sense. We never really discussed the idea of individually scoring each audio log ahead of time. I just got an email one day from Steve after they had done the first round of voice recording with Sarah Grayson, who did an amazing job as Sam, and he said, he said he'd been thinking about the idea of giving each log a piece of music to ground it in the proper tone. So I just started doing these short 20 to 60 second pieces, and that ended up being the bulk of the work for the game. It was a very iterative process. I did them in the order they were recorded, and I would just keep sending revisions of each log to Steve, taking his feedback, modifying the piece, and sending it back. Especially at the beginning, the feedback was almost always pull it back more. I've never done music this subdued before. Even more so than most game music, it primarily exists to quietly suggest a mood and tone to the player. Sarah's voice is always the main audio content. The game soundtrack I worked on previous to this was Blendo Games' 30 Flights of Loving, which consists of some really huge, bombastic, brassy pieces. So switching gears to Gone Home and constantly hearing pull it back, pull it back, less melody uh, was surprisingly challenging at first. But over time, I think Steve and I developed a pretty good rapport. For the most part, the diaries required fewer revisions each time. And it's always a good reminder in a collaborative endeavor that your contribution only exists to make the whole work better, not to be seen or heard unto itself. It's weird hanging out with girls. Daniel was around ever since I was little, and other girls? I don't know. But being around Lonnie is like, instantly just right. I gave her the grand Psycho House tour, and took my revenge on Super Nintendo. And it was like, I don't know, I finally found someone I feel normal around. I drove her home and she gave me this tape and said, 
You have got to listen to this. I haven't stopped playing it since. I had seen Bikini Kill and Bratmobile play their first show at the North Shore Surf Club in Olympia. Mm. That was Valentine's Day, 1991. Um, And I was... was kind of blown away by the incredible um, rawness and the honesty that they wrote with um, and the f- kind of flippancy that they had I thought was um, was really interesting but you know to have the opportunity to talk about all of these issues that are really important to young women I thought was really special and I thought that what they were doing was taking the kind of um, intense feminist ideas that had become popular in the 70s with, you know, um, SDSS and now. I mean, those really, you know, incredible ideas and the ideology of feminism, but they were putting it into a language for today, you know, for the 90s, I guess. I mean, that was right. 20 years ago, but it was for young people and it was to relate to topics about sexuality, about sex, about sexual abuse, about sexism and harassment, and all these things that are really um, important for young women, um, coming of age and becoming sexual beings that are really taboo to talk about. Around here, you will find some of Sam's uh, Super Nintendo cartridges that she left behind. Um, obviously, for legal reasons, we couldn't put real games in, um, and so we conscripted a few of our, our friends in the industry who are really talented artists to make uh, cool label art for fake Nintendo games that we came up with. It's so true. Um, the first one was Super Spitfire, and that was uh, by Rachel Morris, who is a cool artist. Um, who? What is it? Uh, the NYU. The um, NYU Game Center. She's done oh, yeah. a bunch of like posters and other art for for them. Um, and that. And then the next one was um, Adventurous the Cat Returns, um, which is yeah, it's sort of a. It's a, it's a mascot platformer. Yeah. It's a Bubsy-esque dude having cat. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's a regular cat. It's not a bald cat. Yeah. It's a regular uh, cat that rides a motorcycle yeah. towards an explosion. Yeah. But yeah, Lee Petty is the art director at Double Fine and worked on Brutal Legend, and I think he, he led up um, stacking. And Which yeah, awesome. he was uh, he was nice enough to spend some of his free time making the label for Adventurous The Cat Returns. Yeah. Yeah, we... Um, we ran into him at GDC and he offered to help us out and we were all like, cool. We were like, oh, you didn't think we'd take you up on that offer, did you? Draw us a cat. (laughs) Yeah. He regretted the error of his voice. Uh, And then the third one uh, is Journey of Crystal, uh, which is sort of a JRPG um, beast uh, and that was done by uh, Gen Z. Yeah. Okay. She's the art director at Supergiant. She did pretty all of the art in Bastion okay, um, and cool. is working on Transistor. I know we had some people say that they they rec- you know they they could tell that it was her mm-hmm. art because it it does it has such a signature look it's you know pretty distinctive. to to how she does things. So it was really cool and really exciting to have 
to have uh, these really talented people from other studios that are inspirations to us uh, contribute their unique art to the game. So these are stereographic, stereoscopic, Stereogram. stereograph. Yeah, these are stereograms. Yeah, that's the stereogrammatic. Yeah, uh, stereograms um, popularized by the Magic Eye brand of of images from yeah the eighties and nineties. Um, these really work. Like if you cross your eyes and you can do a, a Magic Eye image, you can see what's in these. Um, spoilers. They yeah. are. <gasps> Well, as I recall, there's a cool shark. And? I don't remember what the other one is. <laughs> Carla! What? It's a, it's a big heart. Okay, it's hard for me to do those things. <laughs> uh, and that's true for a lot of people. So the two, the two instances of people not being able to see those images are they just can't do them, which a lot of people just can't do them, or they were born in the late 90s or after the 90s and played our game and didn't oh, know yeah. what the hell these things were. Yeah, like, what is this weird <laughs> static shit? Yeah. Well, I thought it was, weird. like, we got some messages that were like, I thought it was just a weird drawing. So good. <laughs> so, um, yes, as you get older, you can't hear really high-pitched sounds anymore and you know what magic eyes are still. It's the circle of life. I was uh, one of the hosts of the Idle Thumbs video game podcast for a year or two, and I you know, go on there and every once in a while those guys are my friends, and I didn't want to put Idle Thumbs references all over the game, but I did want to have Idle Thumbs references in the game, so we localized them entirely to this one piece of paper. Uh, so almost everything on here is an Idle Thumbs reference, and specifically to a weird exchange that we had about Will Wright's GDC talk in like 2008, where he didn't want everybody to show up and crowd the place, so he gave his speaker name as Phaedrus, um, and then did a talk about a bunch of crazy stuff, including the idea of rocket mail, which was going to be like done by the, it was, it was pitched by the US Postal Service in the 50s and stuff. So. And, and then the thing on the podcast was about how Phaedrus had a little brother, and so anyway, whatever. The brother, of course it's a Phaedrus, and you can't hardly see the icon in the back because it's obscured, but there's this 50s rocket icon in the back that's like the the logo of um, of Phaedrus Motors. And then also it's a, a di the reference that Will Wright was making, and that is a secondary reference here because it's a motorcycle thing, is that in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, the book, um, the author is having kind of an ongoing exchange with this this character of um, of from Greek history called Phaedrus and motorcycles and blah blah blah. So it's a big knot of obnoxious references to lots of different stupid things. Um, Barf Burger is enjoyed by all. Um, I so so the thing is, I drew the Barf Burger uh, because I drew all of Lonnie's drawings. Um, so I drew the uh, two cats on the motorcycle and uh, yeah, the Captain Allegra drawings and stuff like that. Um, and that was that was really. Be I think that it goes hand in hand with 
I did Lonnie's handwriting in the game, and Carla did Sam's handwriting. And that was partly because the two of us were going to be working the most closely on this stuff, and so being able to just quickly like rewrite a note that we wanted to change and scan it and update the game and not have to like email somebody to say, oh, could you write that again or whatever was really useful. And also we both just happened to have sloppy teenager handwriting that looks believably uh, 17 years old. Also, I have a believably 17-year-old level of drawing skill, so uh, that worked too. Um, but it, it was it was fun because basically the notes were created in real life in essentially the same way they were in the fiction, where I would write my part of the note and then hand the piece of paper to Carla and she would write her part of the note, and we just constructed it that way. The assets that I really liked creating in the game were these uh, board games. So there's uh, three in total of them throughout the house. Um, ideally, there'd be more, but uh, you know we had to focus on the, the getting the balls built and things like that. Um, but I really like them. They're just a, a simple extruded cube. Um, there's something about um, environment design that's really fun. It's really a goofy aspect of it. We have to create fake brand names. We have to create fake toys and fake storefronts. Um, maybe my favorite is. Um, in the game Costume Quest, when you're going through the shopping mall, there's a, a store called uh, Why Not Flip Flops, uh, which always makes me really happy. But this one is a parody of um, Dream Foam, uh, which is an awful game that came out in the, in the early 90s, where you sit around a table with your, your girlfriends and you pick up this uh, plastic pink phone and, and call these, these sexy boys and you see which one likes you. It doesn't really suit Sam's personality exactly. But I think he maybe it was given to her by a, a well intentioned relative who doesn't quite have a personality. Uh, down, and maybe she played it once on a lark, and then uh, you know put it in the closet, and, and that's where it stays. Mom and Dad are much more actively religious. You know, there's like a there's a Bible in the in the foyer, and there's a Bible in Dad's uh, bedside table. Um, well, or arguably, they want to appear actively religious. But yes. yeah, I I think that I mean my intent was that they aren't super religious, but they probably still go to church. And they also probably they would feel bad if they put their Bibles away. They'd be like, oh, we need you know we need those to be out for us to look at to right. consult in case we need them yeah. or something. Um, but it's definitely, you know, I don't know, it comes from my own experience of my parents went to church and were more religious and, and stuff. And as, I don't know, around when I was like 10 or 12 or something, I was just sort of like, I remember having a conscious realization of just, no, this makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I was like, this is all about a guy who was dead and then came back from the dead. That doesn't happen. Mm. Magic isn't real. Wow. <laughs> uh, and, and it was, and then there was a, you know, a, a, the process of like just being like okay well I you know I'm just not going to go to church. I also remember having a conscious realization that the only reason I wanted to go to church was because after the service they gave you free donuts. Oh yeah. No, that's fine. <laughs> uh and so I don't know it's probably just partially me projecting um and trying to show that Sam is reexamining her own values as she as she gets older and grows out of childhood and doesn't necessarily share the same beliefs that her parents do. I never tried really hard to, like, I don't know, actually, yeah, I don't know, I, it was normal church behavior, like, I would go and, like, help out with, you know, my younger siblings, and, like, my parents always went to church and whatever, and would go along, and there were people, there was, like, a couple of people that I knew there and everything, but it took me until I, I was about, th yeah, I think I was, like, 13 or 14, and I spent a significant amount of time really trying to, like, do the, to be like, all right, I'm gonna do this church thing. I'm gonna try really hard, and I, um, I would like, 
get annoyed at people when they said oh my god and stuff because I thought that was what you were supposed to do and I think it was I don't know it lasted like whatever six or eight months or something and then I just it broke and I couldn't do it anymore and I I forget what I, I did something uh I I ruined something uh in the church through total uh not caring. I um I, I built a I remember now. I built a house of cards out of a um, Bible trivia um uh, like flashcard set. set. Yeah. Well, it was like it was just like trivial pursuit, except it was Bible based. Mm. Um, and I built like this big house of cards, and I at one point I remember thinking, all right, you know, fuck it, and I glued the cards into place. <laughs> So I had this big house of cards that was glued together, <laughs> totally like ruining all the gun in cards. And um, at that point, uh, I stopped having to go to church so much. A lot of Gone Home is about pointless interactivity <laughs> that is sort of things being interactive for the sake of them being interactive, but um, it really comes from our inspirations of immersive sims uh, like System Shock and Bioshock and Thief, where um, a big part of the design philosophy behind those games and Gone Home is that the world needs to be really internally consistent, and there's this feeling that if there's something that your character might do, you should be able to do it in the game. So in Bioshock, for instance, you can flush all the toilets and you can turn on all of the faucets. And that's also true in like Deus Ex and, uh, and, and Dishonored. Like, and sometimes, you know, like the water fountains in Deus Ex give you like one health or whatever, but really you can interact with them because there's this expectation of if you could interact with that, if you encountered it in this world, we should let you do that, right? So. Um, you know, all of the faucets in our game uh, can be turned on, and they are just, they can be turned on so that you can turn them on and you can flush all the toilets, and it extends into our philosophy behind you can pick up every plastic cup and toothbrush and Kleenex box, not because it's going to add a whole lot to your understanding of this world to be able to look at the underside of a cup, but to pay off that expectation and say to the player, yeah, you could pick that up and look at it, so we're going to let you do that, and it's going to be consistent interactively with the stuff that is important, and that makes it your job to look at everything and give it your attention and for you to decide and understand and figure out what has significance and what doesn't, and not for us to tell that to you. I mean, I've always, one of the most comforting things in the world to me is having somebody, like, brush my hair or stroke my head like my mom when I wasn't feeling well. I could lie down in her lap to just brush my hair. It would always make me feel better. In, like, the weirdest way, I couldn't figure out why, but it just seemed like this friendly connection to somebody that, it, it is, like she says, it is strangely intimate in a way that I'd not really, I guess, put into words until reading that part of the script. Well, that's what I was thinking of, was like that connection, that sort of human touch that it's something so friendly and so loving that you can do. And that that whole idea of like touching someone's scalp being so intimate, just it just made me think of that. Just those wonderful little moments where just a touch can be so much more.
the boxes of tampons uh, that you can find in the washrooms around the house. Um, they weren't originally on the list of items that needed to be modeled, but when you're creating a bathroom at the level of fidelity, and when you're, you're creating a bathroom for a teenage girl, no less, um, the idea of not having something like that is uh, it's, it's kind of jarring. It was kind of jarring to me. Um, especially because when you're at that age, your period is something that um, kind of really defines your, your mood at any given day, and maybe what you wear and where you go. So, uh, you know, I just thought it was, uh, you know, something necessary for visual storytelling, especially of a girl going through what she's going through.